Kia ora everyone and welcome back to Humankind. In this video I'm going to take you through how to play the start of the game. You can see I've just loaded up a new world here. I'm in the nomadic era. I'm indeed a single hunting party of but one unit, one tribal unit. In this video we're going to play through the nomadic era. I'm going to sort of jump around a bit, uh, teach you about the UI, curiosities about the map itself, the different units we have, what the right thing to do with this, your only tribal unit, is, and then finally, how and where we settle. Basically, some tips, tricks, and strategy for this, the nomadic era in humankind. So let's jump straight in. As I say, you start with this one army. It's called a hunting party. And inside of the army, you can see there is but one unit, one tribe. Now the tribe is a special unit, it's a nomad, and what that means is it gathers food by fighting, ransacking, or making discoveries on the map to multiply. Indeed, this hunting party will expand to two, three, potentially four units, and we can split them up as we go. You can see here my unit has four movement, and there are other options here like skipping its turn, stationing it, and healing it, or regrouping as well. The key in this, the Neolithic era, are these up in the top left. We need to try and complete these sort of in-game missions. Indeed, get these era stars. And you can see basically there are three things. We're trying to increase our population. At the moment, we have a population of one. Each unit counts as one population. Or your cities or outposts can count as one too, but we'll get to that in a minute. You're also trying to discover knowledge, curiosities hidden around the map. We'll find some of those soon. And we can also earn era stars, indeed score, which allows us to progress through into the next age where we can choose our own sieve or our own culture. The last thing to do is to hunt animals, and we'll find some of those soon as well. But first and foremost, have a look at this beautiful map, choose your unit, and start exploring, right? We have four movements. I'd recommend you take them one at a time. Uh, but you can see that crossing over certain features like this river will cost me all of my movement. This number indicates how many turns it will take. You can see it's going to jump one, two, and so on. So let's cross this river. And now you can see that it used all four of my movements. So as you're moving around, humankind, you could have moved this way like I did and got one. Or you could have moved this way and went one, two, three, four and revealed much more of the map. The only real upside to moving this way as opposed to this way is the geography, okay? Humankind has a really layered map, and you can see it here playing out. Look at this. One, two, three, four, five layers just in this one little portion. And indeed, the higher up you are, the more of the map you'll see. You'll also get combat uh, bonuses throughout as well. I'm going to end this first turn, having not achieved a lot. <laughs> but now we can move to this. A discovery. You can see there's another one down here as well. These are all over the map. This one here I can tell is a food discovery, right? You can tell by the little icon and by the fact that it looks like some berry bushes. Indeed hovering over it will give me some details about that tile as well, but more on that later. Let's jump to this discovery. Fantastic. So down the bottom right here you'll see our map notifications. You can see that I've unlocked a world deed, more on that in a minute, but moreover We've also found this curiosity, and this one was a freshwater harvest which gave us 15 food, and you can see here we now only need 5 more food for our hunter-gatherer tribe unit to turn into 2. So let's see if we can get that again, dismissing these notifications and moving along to try and get vision over the map. Now I do know that there's a discovery down here, but it's going to take me 3 turns to get to that one, and I think I can probably find one faster than that. So I'm going to explore around taking note of natural resources, and also these dotted lines. These are the boundaries between territories. So when you settle a territory, you'll capture everything within its boundary, but nothing beyond it. And that's something to bear in mind as we move forward. Speaking of moving forward though, let's keep moving. Uh, as you move through with your tribesperson, I would recommend that you move one tile at a time wherever possible. Uh, reason being, you may uh, just sort of discover something at the end of your vision that you might not have otherwise been able to move to if you'd just instantly moved four tiles. Now we've made some interesting further discoveries. Something you need to know about humankind is that the world in the Neolithic era is filled with these animals. There are mainly two to choose from. 
there are these giant woolly mammoths and also deer around the map. Deer can generally be taken on by one unit. You can 1v1 the deer. If you've got high ground, even better. However, these mammoths, as you can see by hovering over it, are actually more powerful than a single tribal unit, so you're going to probably need two of them to take one mammoth on. Even with the high ground advantage here, you can see my strength uh, fails in comparison. Thankfully, this little icon suggests that this mammoth is a peaceful unit, so I can likely move past it without it triggering combat with me. I'm going to continue moving to this, a sanctuary. Now this is also a peaceful place. You can tell by the peace symbol. There are other things around the map called layers, which have a lightning bolt symbol, and that means they're going to run after you. Now up here in my hunting party, I can select this option, ransack. And if I click that on the map overlay, I'll see these tiles glowing white. These are the ones that I can ransack. The sanctuary can be ransacked, and you can see here I'll get 20 food, and it'll take one turn. So I'm going to click that tile like that, and then end my turn. <laughs> and indeed, my tribes people will ransack the sanctuary, and you can see, wha-bam, we now have two tribes people, and nearly at a third one within this hunting party. Now that I've got two, I'm feeling a little bit more adventurous, and I know that there's a second mammoth up this way. However, before that, I've encountered this, a world deed, and you'll see it's rewarding me 50 of this. This is fame. You can always keep track of your fame up here in the top left, and you can see that there are two other players in the game with me. Another player has 50 fame, so they've clearly made a discovery like me, and the third player sadly has none. Fame is one of the victory conditions in humankind, so it's important. I'll cover that more in separate videos, but just note that fame is important for your victory. Indeed, being the most famous empire will secure you the victory, so long as the world isn't destroyed through murder, a space race, uh, nuclear arsenals, and so on and so forth before then. Uh, you can see this one, if I click this little magnifying glass, it'll take me to the discovery, and it was indeed a beautiful natural wonder from down under the Great Barrier Reef. And if I hover over it, you can see what it will give me. These yields may or may not make sense to you. We'll cover more of them later, but what you need to know is it provides food, influence, stability, and money. The key one there is influence, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But for starters, here's a nice target for us. Now, we are unfortunately on low ground. This would put us in generally a bad position to be attacking from. But the deer is right in the way, so I'm going to strike. I have two options, I can manually resolve the battle or instant. In this case, it's a solid enough victory and we're early enough in the game in this fairly basic tutorial, so I'm going to go instant resolve. And if we click the dialogue there, we'll open up an event, we'll get to that in a sec, but first and foremost, let's click open on the battle screen, and you can see we defeated them. Unfortunately, we lost a unit, uh, sorry, they lost a unit, we lost nothing, but we gained five food and five influence. Food, as we know, is important for growth, for growing these tribal people, and later for growing our cities. Here, you, as I have mentioned, 20 food is required to get an additional unit. Now, we also got 5 influence, and if I direct you up to the top right hand uh, corner of the screen, you can see influence here. Influence is very important in the Neolithic era. In fact, aside from food and science, it's really the ultimate resource for you. Reason being, you use it to manage and establish outposts. This is how you claim territory, which can later be turned into cities. I can do that within my hunting party by clicking the action to the left of Ransack, claim territory. Uh, let's discuss that momentarily, but first and foremost, I will just quickly cover this dialogue box has appeared. Humankind game has over 150 unique events. You can see this one is about a world of flame. Indeed, a thin cord of smoke cuts up in the sky, and I have a few options here. I can either chase. Raw numbers will help us more than building techniques at this time, and a new army of refugees will appear next to my hunting party. Alternatively, I can choose Extinguish, which will give me minus 25% on city defense research costs. At the moment, I'm more interested in this, gaining extra units so I can explore as much of the world as possible, so I'm going to choose Chase, and you can see here, boom, I've now got a separate tribal unit. Now it's also important to note here that you can actually manage these units separately as well, so you might say, I don't want three people running around, because the most I'll probably ever need for early game combat is two. So I'm going to click one of these units and move them out separately. And you can see I can do that while these other two can go a different way. 
This unit is freshly claimed this turn, and something to note extra for experts, when you pick up a new unit in a given turn, whether it's through acquiring food or through a special event, they actually have full movement on the turn you get them. So you can see that I can send this person out immediately over here, and would you look at that, there's some wild berries, <laughs> fantastic stuff. If I pop down to my notifications down here, you can just um, refresh on what's happened so you can see that I got 30 science from discovering the Great Barrier Reef. We completed that ransack earlier and a whole load of other notifications down the bottom here. If you do get a little bit bored uh, of the notifications, you can just close the menu and you can also turn map focus on and off. That will sort of draw your camera around to each notification. I prefer to have it off, but ultimately that's up to you. Right. Now, we'll continue to ex explore with this unit. Yes, indeed, here's the Great Barrier Reef. We'd like to claim that, and we'll end our turn. We're shaping up pretty well. You can see we're making progress on our growth star. We need but one more population to complete that one. So let's fan out these units and see if we can explore as much of this map as possible. I'm gonna select maybe these two units by just holding control click, and then right clicking to move them out and now you can see I have three different uh, tribal parties, three different hunting parties on the move exploring. These ones I'm going to use for combat because there's two of them, so they'll be able to overpower that mammoth. These other ones that have uh, simply one unit each, I'm going to send them off, hopefully, to scavenge food, nuts and berries. And here's another type of curiosity. This one, you'll notice, has a different symbol. This is the scientific curiosity. We'll discover science from this. And this, of course, is a food one like we had before. So we'll get food, growth, and units out of that. Let's continue to move, continue to explore. We want to paint as much of the map as possible. And one of our goals in the Neolithic era, and also as we move through into the, the game's first sort of proper era, quote unquote, is to try and grab as much land as we can. Humankind really rewards players who establish lots of outposts. So let's do that next turn. I'll skip through to turn seven, and first let's jump over here to this hunting party, and you'll see this mammoth has absolutely blocked me. What I'm going to do is step up onto this high ground. That's going to reveal a lot of the map, as you can see. We've found another sanctuary that we could move on to and ransack using that. We've seen another deer. We've seen a lair. This is the uh, more aggressive version of the sanctuary. It can indeed spawn evil things, so do take care. But now that we've got the high ground over the mammoth, let's do it. You can see we're well favoured to defeat it, despite having a slightly damaged unit. So let's instantly resolve that battle and open up the battle screen. Just dismiss that for a minute. And it was a great success. You can see we really harvested this bad boy. 20 food and 20 more influence. We took uh, some combat strength and health losses, but ultimately we did slay that woolly mammoth. And one final thing to note as you're moving around is you'll see here, if I hold right click, it tells me that I can get to this rocky field to discover this in one turn. But what it's not taking into account is geography that's sort of hidden in the fog of war, like these. So you'll see if I move this one tile this way, oh, there's actually a giant mountain range, and it's actually going to take me three turns. This is another reason why it's super important that you move one tile at a time. It's not just for map vision, but it's also so you don't get caught out by unexpected geographical features or indeed enemy military units. Let's head down this way to these guys and establish our first outpost. If I click the claim territory symbol here, you can see the map overlay appears and we can see tile yields as far as the eye can see. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of visibility with this tribal unit, so it may be more beneficial for us to move them to high ground. But before I do that, something I just want to really quickly show you is that you can see the yields from every tile and the total yields that the outpost will produce. This tile here looks to be my best one. It's going to give me 11 food per turn and 8 industry or production per turn. That's quite good. As a general rule of thumb, I would recommend you go no fewer than 7 production and ideally more than 10 food. These are my baselines. I like a 10-7 at least, preferably more like a 10-10 or, or, or even an 11-11, that's uh, 10 food and 10 production. But for the time being, that's probably the best spot. But overall, I'm not super pleased with that. Here we have it. I've just plopped down a test one, just right there on that unit. And you'll see I've earned an era star by growth. And now I can advance through into the next era. So let's do that very quickly now. 
we can choose a new culture. Now, choosing a culture is an entirely different topic for an entirely different video. But I think I should just quickly point out a few that are really strong for you to help you through the, the Neolithic era. My recommendations would be one of four. The Babylonians have a wonderful ability to build science and food. I like them a lot. If you're interested in production and all things industry, you can't go wrong with the Egyptians. These guys have a great uh, bonus to their industry and production and a reasonable unit uh, and emblematic quarter as well. If we skip ahead a little bit, Zhao uh, Chao is another good one. Uh, you get stability, which sort of helps keep your empire in line. You can think of that as happiness of your people and a good uh, district as well. But the ultimate choice, if you can nab it, are these guys, the Harappans. They have, their trait is fertile inundations. Now, this first thing is called a cultural trait, and you'll keep that throughout the rest of the game. Whether you change cultures, whether you keep the same culture, it doesn't matter. You will keep this ability forever. So choosing the Harappans will forever give you plus one food on tiles that already produce food, which is a lot of them, and plus one food on river tiles. You'll also get a fantastic district that you can build, and a great a uh, unit that replaces your tribal people. It's faster, it's stronger, it's called the runner. I'm going to become the Harappans because I think they're the best ancient era culture. I have a full video on them on my channel if you'd like to know more. I'll click adopt and confirm. And now the game will launch me through into the next era. Indeed, the game's sort of first era, you'll see, moving into era number one the ancient era. Now let's continue where we left off. I'd slap down this outpost right here on this unit just to simply just to form it. But actually we've got a lot more we can do. Before I end this video, there are a few more things I'd like to discuss. First and foremost, down the bottom right here, there are a few useful buttons for you. Okay, you can open up the Humankind Encyclopedia if you wish. But moreover, there are some map overlays down here that are, that are particularly spicy. Clicking this one will reveal all of the yields from your tiles. So if you build a city here, it's going to get extra food, right? This tile here is producing two food, whereas this one's only producing one. This tile isn't producing any food, but it's a more productive tile. And you can see as you move around the map, different features provide different things. This tile will give you science. These mountainous tiles are great for production, but not for food. And then some of the tiles that have strategic resources, like this horses one, will also offer unique bonuses. So you can turn that on and have a real scan around the map to try and figure out where the best places to settle might be. Ironically, this spot here where I settled purely for the sake of this video is actually a fairly good food and productive spot. The only downside to it is, unfortunately, it was settled right on a border with another territory. Uh, in the early game, that's not very good because you can't work those tiles. However, as you progress through the game, you can connect territories and allow them to share resources and allow cities to share their production too. So it's not ultimately the end of the world, but ideally you wouldn't settle right on a border for your first place. Down here also you can turn on the hexagonal grid for those of us who are Sid Meier's Civilization players and get some extra joy out of that. Let's jump over to this unit though and place down another territory claim. We'll indeed claim another territory up here. Now you can see that this one's going to cost me 20. That's okay, I can afford it. But what I'm really interested in is are there good enough spots for me? I could settle here and go huge production but no food. And down the line that could be a good strategy if I were to claim the territory next door, a tile like this, which has huge food and no production. Indeed the two cities and territories could merge and share. But for the time being, again, I'm more interested in a more balanced city. And so I can just move around and this wonderful in-game overlay will tell me all of the tile yields. This one, again, is a border territory, but it's actually quite a good one. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to settle here because it's met my golden standard. I've got at least 10 food and at least 7 production. In fact, in this case, I've got 12. So let's move here and settle. You can see it's also next to a resource, so I'm getting lots of high yields. Now, when you establish an outpost, you will make a claim on the territory. You can see I've claimed two territories with the dotted lines. They are adjacent, which is also nice. In general, you should try and claim adjacent territories to each other. It tends to be cheaper. Up in the right here, you can see the outpost creation is happening. It takes a few turns to turn this ramshack little sort of pulled together tribes person village into a proper outpost. And then later in the game, outposts can be converted into cities. In fact, not that much later. But you can see here, and this is the reason why I suggest at least seven 
at least seven industry is because outposts take 35 uh, industry or production to produce, regardless of where you build them. If you have at least seven, that will ensure it will take you no longer than five turns to create and formally establish your outpost. Once your outpost is established, you can start building things like resource extractors on tiles. You can start uh, turning it into a city and building districts around that city. So I'm pretty happy with that. I'm pretty happy with, with that outpost there. Uh, if I flash back over to these guys, they can actually continue hunting. Here is the third unit that tends to appear near these dangerous layers, and you'll notice it's a more aggressive unit. It's a bear. So I'm going to take that down with my very powerful runners now that have been upgraded, and you can see instant resolve across the board. That time we managed to get some money instead of food and influence. As we move through into the ancient era, you'll see that more and more often. But we did successfully defeat them, and now the land is ours. Down here though, this battle is a really close call. You'll notice now that my units have been upgraded from tribesmen to runners, they're a little bit stronger. So what I could do now is step up onto this hill, again getting a slight geographical advantage, and then lay waste to this mammoth. I'm going to try and see what happens. Ooh, and you can see this one was a close fight, right? We took 68% damage, but we did defeat it and gained 20 gold in the process. Nice to see it. Again, I can keep track of my notifications down the bottom here. You can see that another civilization has chosen a culture. They've chosen an aggressive culture. So I'll need to take note of that and remember it for next time. These units are a little bit weak, so I could choose to move them into friendly territory and heal them up like so. Now that they're within my borders or what are soon to be my proper borders, I can click this little button and regroup that unit and that will heal them up. Likewise, I could do it to this one as well, but I might continue to explore down south because we've still got a lot of the map to paint. And it's really crucial that you get out and explore, not just to discover wonders, which could find you fame, and discoveries, which can net you food and science, but also to figure out where the enemy is and find more lands to take as your own. Very, very important stuff here. Very important. Thanks to the high production in this city, it's now established as an outpost, I should say. Now that the outpost is up and running, I can head over here once clicking on it and I can click evolve your outpost into a city and boom, it is instantly evolved and you'll see lots has changed. As a city now, it's producing all of the main yields in the game aside from faith. I'm getting some money, some science, some food, some industry or production and some influence per turn and you can keep note of those up the top right here. And if you click into the city screen, you can see how much of each individual resource it's creating. You can also see over here that I can place districts, build infrastructure, train units, and conduct public ceremonies. These are generally not very good, particularly in the early game, but you'll want to start maybe building some districts. That'll be the first thing to do in your cities. I won't delve too much into district building in this game, uh, in this video, <laughs> but one thing to note is that this district, your special one, in my case it's the canal network, can only be built while you're this culture. While you're your current culture, you can build your special district, but when you change, you can't build that district anymore. So you might want to build these as a priority. My one is really good for food, so I'm going to click it, and the game's going to give me a great overlay and make some suggestions on where I can place it. In this case, it's suggesting I place it here. It'll give me five food, but I'll lose some stability. Again, that's my empire's sort of happiness, its social structure. I could build it here, and then I'd have a few spots around it to build adjacent farmers' quarters. Indeed, districts in this game do have adjacency bonuses. So it pays to stack like districts together. So if I build my special one here, I might then choose to place a farmer's quarter next to it. I've discovered some enemy borders, these coloured lines, and I don't want them moving too close or taking territories that I consider to be mine. So I'm going to use this unit to create, uh, to claim a territory. You can see some really high food territories here and high production. This is a fantastic spot, largely due to the fact that it's along a river on fertile lands. My culture in particular loves that. This is a great city with a collective total of plus 31 between its food and its industry. I'm claiming that outpost no problem. And realistically, later in the game, I'm probably converting this outpost into a city and then into my capital because this is a great spot and exactly where I want to be. Look at these tile yields in comparison to some of the more lackluster ones around my first outposts. 
this is the place to be. And again, this reinforces the fact that if you scout out hard and fast, not only will you be able to do the land grab better than everybody else, but also you'll be able to hopefully find ideal city locations for you and what your culture does best. And finally, you can see that we've also unlocked the technology screen. Uh, I, in general, you're probably going to want to pick up all of these early game techs, but there are a few that are particularly uh, noteworthy. Domestication will reveal horses to you and allow you to uh, harvest them, farm them. Uh, the Artisan's Quarter will allow you to extract luxury resources as well, so Calendar is pretty dang good. You can clear forests for production, just like in Civilization VI. Uh, and also as you move through the tree, another one I will just highlight. Uh, organized Warfare is quite good if you plan on going into combat. This allows you to reinforce units into long sieges in combat, so it, it's really useful. I'll just make a note of that for you as well, but don't stress too much if you don't understand that at that point. It's all good. Again, as you play through the ancient era, it's very similar to the uh, Neolithic era before it. However, you will start to be establishing cities in the ancient era. And you'll notice your opponents will be grabbing more and more territories as well. So it shifts uh, away from that sort of nomadic uh, tribe, sort of high mobility era, and more into a more fixed, indeed locked down in place kind of play style in the ancient era. Thank you very much for watching this, my guide on how to play the Neolithic era in humankind, and some tips and tricks along the way. One final thing you may note down the bottom here is there's a third map overlay that's been unlocked, a really useful one for planning out your cities. If you click it, it will highlight districts and color code them. You can see that my central palace here is color coded white, and indeed food districts will be color coded green, and so on and so forth. Do make use of these as they're pretty useful, particularly as you're learning the game and trying to figure out, you know, what districts have you built and where have you built them. Very useful. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you do enjoy humankind content, I'd really love it if you consider dropping a like rating or subscribing to my small but growing community. And until next time, everybody, take care and I'll see you then. Bye-bye.